Let me introduce myself to the people who are going to be listening to this. I'm Michael Sulawan, long li- long-time Black Sabbath fan and founder of Emerald Sabbath. And I'm talking to Dave the B. Spitz, former nuclear assault and Black Sabbath basis. How are you doing, Dave? You all right? I'm pretty good. How are you, Mike? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Not too bad. I'm just going to pose some questions to you that some fans uh, of Emerald Sabbath have posted to me. One is from a guy called Hans Ruff. And he wanted to know, how did you end up in Black Sabbath, and what bands were you in before Black Sabbath? Uh, well, let's see. Before Black Sabbath, quite a few bands. Uh, I had a bunch of, bunch of bands up in you know, high school and college that people probably wouldn't know about. Uh, Rockside, Freeway, some other ones. Um, we did some original recording with Freeway. And it's kind of a long story, so I'm not going to tell the whole story. But uh, when I was still up in... Uh, in um after I graduated college up near Rochester, upstate New York, uh I got a call to join a to audition for a band called Americade with two brothers out of Brooklyn. So I ended up, you know, getting that gig. I was in Americade for several years, had a couple of bands after that. And during Americade we hired Jeff Glicksman, a very famous record producer who produced Kansas, Saxon, Gary Moore, Paul Stanley solo album. Right. You know, very yeah. famous producer. And we hired him to do Americade, and that, long story short, him and I, while we were recording the second Americade album, uh, Jeff Glicksman and I got to be very close. He recognized uh, the beast and his talent, and he said, someday you're going to hear from me. And a couple of years later, I ended up getting a call from him and Tony Iommi to come down and, and play with Sabbath. So that's that's the short version of the story. Right. Uh, so, so, so it's Jeff Glicksman is a, is a, is a middleman, more or less. Jeff, Jeff Lickson recommended me to Tony Iommi because right. we had recorded to, and, uh, and everything happened from there. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, Timothy Scruggs wants to know where he can find the Americada album. Americade. The Americade, band's called Americade. <laughs> yeah, where can they be Americade, called? Well, um, I, I believe that uh, Gerard DeMarini, he's, he's the, uh, he was the main songwriter, one of the two brothers, Gerard and PJ DeMarini from Brooklyn. I believe that all the Americade recordings are on Spotify. I believe that's where he has them. So if you go on there and you search for Americade, you'll be able to find all the Americade recordings uh, and you can purchase them that way. I'm I'm not sure if the albums uh, themselves are still being printed or available, but you know, uh, I'm pretty sure you can if you just do a Google search for Americade, I'm sure you'll find where you where you can purchase the songs. I, I believe they're sold by, you know, song by song. Right, days. right, brilliant. Um, Tinsuko K- uh, Ketuchi from Japan uh, said in a 1986 article, a Japanese heavy metal magazine said that uh, you had suggested to Tony Iommi to recruit Ray Gillen uh, when, when, when Glenn Hughes had gone from Sabbath. Was it, was it you that suggested um, Ray Gillen to Tony Iommi? Absolutely. Absolutely. Ray and I were friends. I saw Ray sing a couple of times. He was in Bobby Rondinelli's uh, band at the time. Right. You know, during White Lion, White Lion uh, you know, we used to rehearse in the basement of Lemoore's in Brooklyn, which was like the most famous rock club pretty much on the East Coast back then. And, um, you know, we used to go to a lot of shows there, obviously, when we weren't playing. And I saw Ray singing there, and I saw him one other time. And I ended up uh, speaking with him, and uh, he was just incredible. I thought the guy had so much talent. And when Tony Iommi and Don Arden, you know, came to me and asked me, you know, if I knew any great singers for Sabbath after Glenn left, you know, I, I absolutely told them all about Ray, and then I put them in touch with Ray, and that's how it started. Yeah. So I, I, I pretty much covered Ray Gillen. Rest, rest his beautiful soul, man. Yeah. He was great, yeah. Because I got another question similar by um, uh, Black Sabbath fan Johnny Angel. Um, he's asked. He wants to know from you. Were you in er, Were you in Badlands with Ray Gillen at all in the early days? A band called Badlands. <laughs> That's a funny question. That's another long story. I actually was not in Badlands, but it was my idea originally no. to start that band. You're joking. After uh, Ray and Eric Singer and I had left Sabbath uh, each at different times, um, I had an idea to, to, for the three of us to get together, you know, to form a super group with, with Jakey e. Lee. No way. And no. Uh, I don't want to tell the entire story. But, right. Um, so you, you, know, formed, um, you formed a band that you weren't in. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, what happened was, 
you know, I was I was in New York, and the other guys were in L.A., and, uh, you know, I got in touch with Jakey, and I, you know, told him about my idea, and, you know, another long story. But uh, what happened was, for kind of strange and unknown reasons, I'll, I'll put it that way, um, Jakey ended up choosing another bass player, um, the guy that was a close friend of his, to actually join the band. So. Right. I'll leave it at that, you know. Yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't speak badly about anybody. Things happen in rock and roll That's right. for many, many different reasons. But uh, it was actually my original idea. If anybody wants to purchase some of the Black Sabbath books, I forget uh, what what the title was, but the whole story, I tell the whole detailed story in in a couple of those Black Sabbath right. books. So if you read I had, I, you know I, I had no idea myself that was Badlands was your idea. I don't I think a lot of a lot of, I think a lot of people um wouldn't didn't know, have known that, you know. So yeah, okay. Um Johnny Angel would also write, like to know is what input if any had you on the Eternal Idol album. As you know yourself you were credited on the on the album but Bob Daisley did the bass lines and all that. Is um has any of your stuff ever appeared or uh, on Eternal Idol album at all? Well, you know what? I'm not sure. There's so many bootleg and, and um, unauthorized right. recordings out there. That once again, that's a long story. But yeah. uh, after after we came off the road from Seven Star, you know, we still we started recording and and uh, working on on song ideas for Eternal Idol. Tony and I went to his house. We went through boxes and boxes of of old cassette tapes, right. you know, listening uh, to a lot of songs and riffs, and we we chose a bunch of stuff, and then we wrote a bunch of stuff, you know, during the rehearsals. Right. You know, I, I was in all the rehearsals throughout uh, the Eternal Idol you, session. You, your, base, you know, your, your base score is actually on some kind of woman. Uh, yeah, I'm not really his, sure. Like on I one said, of the demos. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and and you know, again, I don't like to speak uh, yeah. negatively about about other people, but. You know, what I can say is that, you know, we went to to the island of Montserrat at the Air Studios. That's right. Very famous, expensive studios, and, and we were recording, you know, Eternal Idol. And at that time, you know, and during the pre-production, you know, Ray was having difficulty, you know, writing and stuff. He was kind of uh, inexperienced. He was like an amazing God-gifted singer, but he wasn't experienced in, in writing lyrics and melodies. So uh, myself and, and Jeff Nichols... You know, rest rest his soul. Yeah. We miss Jeff also. Obviously. Yeah. You know, we we worked closely with Ray to to come up with a lot of lyrics and melodies, and then we did. You know, we actually recorded most of the songs uh, in in Montserrat, but there was there was some uh, some weird stuff that was happening internally in the band with managers and some other people. Yeah. I'm not gonna we, talk we, about deep. Yeah, we mentioned Jeff. Out of, yeah. uh, by the way, My, yeah. yeah. Listen, my version of, of that part of the story is that they got really nervous, uh, you know, with the fact that they were having trouble with, you know, some of the melodies and, and stuff like that, is that they ended up bringing in Bob Daisley, who was an amazing bass player and very experienced songwriter. I don't know if people know, but he wrote a lot of the riffs and, and, and a lot of the lyrics, you know, for some of the Ozzy stuff, from what I understand. That's right. And I think they pretty much brought him in to try to sort that out, so... You know, there was a lot of weird stuff happening in the band, so I eventually left. And I know Bob Daisley re-recorded some of my bass tracks. I'm really not even sure, you know, uh, which, which ones are, are on the album. It's yeah, kind I of think, a mystery, really. Yeah, I think one of the tracks is Some Kind of Woman, because I've got the shine, uh, the 12th uh, of it, uh, with Black Moon, and Jeff Nichols is playing bass on Black Moon, and you're playing bass on Some Kind of Woman, like, you know? So yeah, they would have be probably rewritten and and new bass scores by Bob put on top of them, like you know. Yeah, like I said, it's possible. When I left, I'm not sure you yeah. know what happened with recordings after I left. I know Bob Daisley does does a lot of the tracks. I, I may be on some of them or some parts of them. You know, we we play very very similar styles. So you know, it's kind of a mystery. But you know, I was in the band that entire time, and uh, as most people know and you know. You know, I did all the touring, uh, most of the touring uh, for Eternal Idol, mm. you know, for a while after the album came out. Yeah. Because uh, everything changed there. Yeah. Robert Cam, he wants to know 
How was it, how was your gig with Bev Bevan and Tony Martin in Athens? Uh, I think, <laughs> if you can remember. <laughs> yeah, sure, I absolutely remember. That's another kind of long story. Uh, Athens, we went to Greece. Um, it was kind of strange because we had you know some other new people that were filling in in the band. We had Bev Bevan and uh, that's right. You know, he came in to play drums kind of at the last minute, and very nice guy. We got along great. But what happened in Athens is an interesting story. There was a heat wave there. It was like 100-something degrees. Yeah. And people were, people were dropping dead like flies, you know, all over all over the city. It was so hot, you couldn't believe it. And we ended up, they, they booked us at this show playing at some ancient stadium, and they set up the stage in the middle of an outdoor field, and uh, it was for, here's a, a very strange part of the story. Um, th- there were people like leaning out of windows and apartments and sitting on these stone steps like far away. And we started playing and there was nobody really, you know, very few people standing like near the band or on, on the field. They were all sitting. And then when we started playing, I, I think it was uh, the song Black Sabbath, like a few songs into the set. We started playing that. Thousands of people rushed the stage and it was like it was kind of like a riot, you know. They had these pretty, pretty junky kind of cheesy light poles, and people started climbing up the light poles, and it became a dangerous situation. And I absolutely remember this, uh, you know, very de- in detail. Right. Uh, it became kind of a dangerous riot type situation. I looked over at Tony, and he looked pretty concerned, and and he gave me a high sign. Look, you know, that's it. You know, we're, the people are jumping onto the stage now. They they only had a couple of security guards, and it got too dangerous. So we threw our guitars over to to the road crew, and we actually ran off the stage across the field into the dressing room and they locked us in there. It's absolutely true story. And, um, you know, there actually was a riot, you know, people were going bananas and we, we weren't allowed to leave. You know, we never finished the show. We only did a few, a handful of songs until this riot started. And we were, you know, we were in locked into the dressing room so no one could get near the band. And it wasn't until several hours later that we were able to leave the venue. So it really turned into like a riot. And when I was running off the stage, there were there were fans that were you know trying to rip my clothes off. And it's lucky I didn't get knocked down to the ground. I could have gotten all of us could have gotten really hurt. So that's a crazy story, you know, with the gig in Athens, pretty much. And the promoter was very upset, you know, and he took us out to a fancy dinner afterwards. And we ended up leaving, I think, uh, like the next day or something. It was yeah. a very short. Is it so crazy story about Greece? That wouldn't happen these days with security and stuff, you know. Yeah, well, they had very, very slim security. There were there were these security guys standing around like the front of the stage or the side of the stage, and they were just sitting around smoking cigarettes. And they didn't when the people started like climbing up on the on the stage, the security guys they didn't even do anything. They didn't know what to do. So that's when Tony looked at me and he gave me. It's like we're out of here, you know. Let's let's. You know, it's too dangerous. We have to get off stage. And then we actually had a, you know, hightail it to the dressing room. So, right. you know, okay. Sorry. Sounds pretty, sounds like a mad story. All right. Anyway, uh, Vinny, yeah. Vinny, 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 really turned into a riot. I'm, I'm not kidding about that. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah you yeah. know, at all. Another part of the story. Uh, Vinny Montella wants to know, how old were you when you got into music? And do you play any other instruments? Oh, let's see. Well, I was a clarinet soloist. I started playing clarinet in the in the school band when I was like in second second grade, second or third grade, and uh, you know I had classical training through uh, you know through clarinet in school. Okay. And uh, hold on, let me get rid of this other call. Um, uh, cl- you know, I played clarinet at a very young age. So I had a lot of classical training when I was really young, and I had natural talent. I okay. guess I was kind of just born with a lot of natural should, musical do still, talent. Do you still play classical instruments at all at any time? No, no I don't. I don't. I don't. I haven't played clarinet in, in years. So, and after that, you know, um, I, I got into rock and roll. I had some older friends, and uh, from up in my summer house up in upstate New York, near White Lake, near where, where the first Woodstock Festival was. I had a, my family had a summer house one that was a mile from the stage you know, where Woodstock was held back in 1969. And, 
you know, I started I started bothering my father that I wanted to play bass. I wanted to be like Jack Bruce from Cream. You know, that he was my first, you know, really big icon kind of influence. I was heavily into Cream and Zeppelin and Sabbath and yeah. and uh, a lot of, you know, Johnny Winter and Frank Zappa and a lot of, a lot of people like that. And, okay. and I kept for my father to buy me a bass and eventually he brought me home a bass. How old, were you, then, how old uh, were you that time? I think I was about 11, 11 oh, or 12, okay. Okay. right right before, during that time, you know, I was interested in guitar, but I was more interested in bass, so I ended up taking like three or four acoustic guitar lessons at, at the local music store in New York, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to play guitar, I just wanted to play bass, that was like my dream, and eventually my father brought me home a bass, and I pretty much taught myself you know, playing bass. Even though I played clarinet and had musical training, you know, in my earlier formative years, you know, I pretty much taught myself stringed instruments. And I used to play piano a little bit and a little bit of sax. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I I still play I still play some guitar, but you know, mainly bass. You know, that that's my whole life is right. bass. Pretty much. Uh, uh, Tom Car Garrow wants to know how did you get the nickname the Beast, if you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of different reasons. Probably from, you know, mainly from the way I play bass, such an aggressive, percussive, <laughs> beastly kind of style. Yeah. You know, I, I've worked, you know, uh, I'm like 50 years now playing bass, over 50 years, right. developing my style, learning from other people, you know, to really develop my own style of bass playing, you know, very aggressive, very percussive exciting kind of uh you know lead bass rhythm rhythm guitar com combined with with bass you know to create the b style and also you know uh from from my great hair i've got great hair i still have my hair is like longer than it's ever been even at my age and also from the ladies nah, you, know, so a lot knew, of you know what i knew you were gonna say that <laughs> yeah, a lot of different reasons you know why they call me the beast uh there was a guy named Steve Weiss. His nickname was Pee Wee. Pee Wee Weiss, he used to babysit for me. He was a close friend from up in my summer house I was talking about before. And he named me and he named all, all the people up in the summer, uh, summer house uh, community. And uh, he's the one that named me Beast. So, uh, and that name stuck. And I started using it, you know, uh, very early on when, when I started playing in bands, you know, in junior high and high school. And I, the name just stuck. So I've, I've kept the name The Beast for all these years, so. Yeah, yeah, and uh, now I'm going to concentrate quickly on about Seven Star. Martin Lundberg, Lundberg wants to know, which song from Seven Star was your favorite to play live? If any. Favorite live? Um, you know, probably, uh, let's see, some of the faster ones, like In For The Kill, we didn't play that live too much. But um, what's what's there's another fast one on there. Dan you know, I Danger Zone. This. No, no, well, Danger Zone is a, is a great song. I know you and I love that song. Not that's not the one I was t talking about. There's another real fast one that that you and I spoke about before. Um, uh, geez. Turn to Stone. Seven. Turn to Stone. Yeah. Turn, turn to Stone. Turn to and Stone. That, that yeah. one was. Be one of my favorite ones to play live because it's so fast and, and exciting and, and you know uh, aggressive kind of song. So, but I also I'll tell you I also love always love playing the song Seven Star. It's such a you know eerie, mysterious kind of creepy you know uh, um, Indian kind of guitar riff. Yeah. You know to this still love that song. Um, you know we haven't played it in any of my other bands lately, but you know I always ask people if they want to do that song. It's just a lot of people don't know it as much, so, yeah. you know, but uh, a lot of the songs, I mean, Danger Zone, you know, you and I have discussed uh, that song many, many times. Yeah. That's a great, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward riff. It really sticks in your head. Another, another great song from Seven Star. A guy called Andreas Andrew, he's writing a book called The Sabbath Rites, Black Sabbath, 1980 to 1995. He's writing a huge book on that era, and he's posted some questions to me about, um, one of them was what we were just speaking about Athens, and you returned for the show in Athens, Greece, which is, uh, and six shows in in uh, Sun City, Super Bowl in South Africa, uh, where Giza was supposed to perform uh, in Black Sabbath Plymouth Festival, but it was cancelled. Did you have time to rehearse for the new lineup for those shows, and especially in the trip to South Africa, because it was last minute thing, like if you can remember. 
I don't. I, I don't understand the question. You're asking me if, if did you did you have time to rehearse for the for the shows and for the South African shows because you were um, yeah sure you had we, we rehearsed we rehearsed uh, at a rehearsal spot in England, you know for, uh, for I don't know for a week or two before we ended up going on on that tour. We did we did some dates in in, in England. And uh, a couple other dates, and then when we went to well, that was to with, South Africa, with, with the dates in England. Um, because w- did you do the dates in England with Ray Gillen? Yes, absolutely. That was, that we was did the, a, that was the Ray Gillen one on the on the Seven Star. On the absolutely. Seven Star we, tour, yeah, yeah London, eight, London Hammersmith, etc. All right, when we played Edinburgh and Scotland and uh, a bunch of other shows, also sure. Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. Uh, and he's also wants to know uh, how did Glenn feel when the album was released as Black Sabbath, and how those difficulties started. You know, uh, because it was supposed to be a Tony Iommi solo album first, like you know. Right. But he wants to know, like, um, how how did it feel when the album was released as Black Sabbath? And I don't uh, know. You know, or I don't know. Uh, how did how did who? Yeah, because it was supposed to be a solo album. It was supposed to be a Tony Iommi solo album at first, wasn't it? Yeah, it was supposed to be a solo album. Originally, the idea was to be a Tony Iommi solo album, and all the greatest metal singers in the world were going to be on the album, you know, including Ozzy. Ozzy, Glenn Hughes, Dio, uh, Rob Halford, you know, a bunch of other people. That was the original idea, that there was going to be a different uh, heavy metal singer on each song. That's right. And then uh, that kind of turned into... You know, uh, Glenn Hughes, you know, uh, singing on the entire album. And then it was going to, you know, they weren't sure what they were going to do. And then I guess the record company decided that the album was so great that they just wanted to put it out as Black Sabbath featuring Tony Aomi. That's right. And that's how it, and then we ended up touring uh, on the album that way. Yeah, on the U.S. leg of the tour, you were supported by Wasp, if I'm correct. Can you? and and. Uh, you were supported by Wasp in America on the U.S. leg of the tour. Can you remember that? Absolutely. It was Wasp oh, and Anthrax. My brother's band, Wasp, Anthrax, Wasp and Anthrax, opened the show. Yeah, how was that? That was great. That was great. That was, that was an amazing uh, concert bill for people to see. Anthrax, Wasp, and, and the new Black Sabbath. You know, people went nuts. I mean, they, you know, three three amazing great metal bands on the same bill at the same night. Yeah. So that Wasp, was great. Wasp, we put a bunch Wasp, of those together. Wasp were massive in America around that time as well, weren't they, like, you know? Yeah, Wasp was pretty popular then. I don't know if they were massive, but, you know, they were, they were pretty popular then. They were... I think you know Wasp was kind of just coming out around that time. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure of the yeah. time. Yeah, it was actually a, you know a very big break for Wasp to be on a, an arena tour. You know at that at that point in their early career. Yeah, but people loved it, man. It was a great show to come see all three you know heavy metal bands at the same concert. That was some lineup: Black Sabbath, Wasp, and Anthrax. I'm telling you. Um, when you went to Europe, did you actually play only in the UK? And, well, obviously you didn't, I don't think. But how would you describe the difference between the US audiences and, and the uh, UK audiences back then? Um, like the crowds and the reactions. Were there, was there a different reaction from the British crowds rather than the American crowds back in Seven Star Tour? If you can remember. You know what? It's hard to remember the, the yeah. crowd reaction. I mean, generally. Yeah. yeah. Very well received because uh, you know even though it wasn't all the original members, you know it was me, me and obviously Eric Singer on drums, and uh, you know Glenn first, and and then uh, you know Ray Gillen, and then and then Tony Martin. But um, you know I, I think all the crowds were great. Yeah. The fans are very to, to to see Black Sabbath perform, and obviously there are a lot of people out there that you know uh, you know really wanted to see the original Black Sabbath members, and we all understood that. Mm. But, you know, it was, you know, it, it, the band was a great band. We sounded great live, and, you know, I think the band was very well received. The, the, all the uh, the critics loved the new lineup, you know, even though it wasn't the original, you know, bla- four Black Sabbath members. You know, Black Sabbath, as we all know, has gone through a lot of changes over the many, many years. For sure. You know, since the late so you know there's different incarnations of black sabbath That's and right. uh 
I, I certainly believe, and I know you do, Mike, that uh, Seven Star was a great record. Oh, and it, still it, love it, it. me personally, it's, hey? uh, it's one of my favorites, like, you know? Yeah. So, you know, uh, as far as the crowd reaction, I think people loved it. They were great. Uh, they, were, they were thankful to see Tony Aomi back up there, even if it was with, you know, a bunch of new players and stuff. And well, the power we young. Jeff. Yeah, Eric Singer and I were, were young. We were in our late 20s at the time we were in Sabbath, and we were very excited to have such a great opportunity to play with, you know, the, I, I, Tony Aomi, who invented heavy metal. Everybody knows that, that Tony pretty much invented heavy metal. That's he invented right. the chunking. The distorted sounds, and obviously Geezer was a big part of that as well with distorted bass sounds and Jack Bruce, like I was speaking about before. You know, I was always into really kind of distorted bass. I, I do not like clean bass sounds. You know, I, I don't play that way. So, yeah. you know, we all grew up kind of sound, and I think people loved it. Like I said, to this day, uh, on Facebook and YouTube, people constantly talk about how good, you know, uh, the lineup was with Seven Star. It was a oh, very yeah. exciting time. In Black Sabbath history, I, for sure. I didn't get to England until 19, early 1988, so uh, to my horror, I missed Seven Star Tour, like an Eternal Idol Tour. I didn't see Sabbath until the Headless Cross Tour with Tony Martin, you know, and Neil Murray and Cozy Powell. So, yeah, I missed the Seven Star and Eternal Idol Tour myself, but, you know, anyway. We were chatting the other day. Can you tell the fans what you're doing at the moment? Um, you said you were rehearsing with... Uh, guy from Overkill the other night. Yes, I have a, a great new band together with myself uh, on bass, uh, one of the world's greatest drummers, Patrick Johansson on drums. Uh, who, people who, should know who, his who name. Was, who was he with before? Or, uh, what can you tell? Uh, Patrick played with Ingve Malmsteen for many years. Ah, right, uh, yeah. He's re He's recorded with Wasp, with uh, Chris and Pelletieri, George Lynch, many, many, many bands. Patrick has done over a hundred and some odd albums. Wow. He's, he's pretty well known here, and he's from Sweden. He's pre I think he's pretty well known overseas in Europe. Yeah. He is one of the greatest drummers living today. And the guitar player is uh, an amazing guy named Dave Linsk. He's been an overkill for uh, you know, for several years, and uh, we met when we we were both uh, participating as in teacher instructors uh, with the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, and we became friends during that time, and we planned to get this project together even before the pandemic hit. Brilliant. So we were on hold while during the pandemic, and now we're going full bear, full bore uh, on this new project. We're looking for a singer. We've been auditioning different singers for the new project. Right. So we're working pretty hard on that right now, and and uh, hopefully people will be hearing about it soon. I, I can't reveal the name yet. We're still talking about the name of the band, but if you if you stay stay posted, you know people yeah. it's gonna will hear about it soon. Yeah. I'm telling you this band is a new super group. It's gonna be amazing. Brilliant. And uh, in, was it when I spoke to you last time? You said you were gonna do something in Florida, some kind of is a convention thing for charity with Adrian Smith from Iron Maiden. No, it's not a convention. It's the same thing I was talking about before, where Dave Linsk and I met. It's called the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Right. It's been around for over three years. Uh, David Fishoff is the CEO and the founder of the company. And what that is is they hire famous rock stars who, who teach and perform for students. So people sign up. You can you can go to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp dot com. Uh, you can do a Google search. You can find it very easily. And uh, what they do is they set up uh, these fantasy camps that last for four days where people sign up and they pay a fee and they come in. You don't have to be in the same state. You can fly in from anywhere in the world to participate. And, you know, you're, you're signing up as like a student. And they have beginners and intermediate and, uh, and higher level students, you know, at any level of whatever – you know, whatever instrument you play, whether it's bass, guitar, drums, vocals, doesn't matter. And you sign up for four days, and basically we have famous rock stars that, that come and participate, and we give lectures, we give master classes and teaching, and then each, each of us is assigned a group with the students, and each band creates a name, and then, you know, you learn songs, you know, yeah. and then you perform two different nights. It's very, very exciting for people to actually get a chance to meet, you know, people like myself. And this year, they got a lot of great people. It's, you're going to have Dave Mustaine. You're going to have Steve Morse from uh, Dixie Dregs and Deep Purple. That's right. Uh, yeah. Nicole McBrain, the drummer from Iron Maiden. 
uh, meet myself, Billy Sheen, wow. and Tony Fallon on playing bass. You know, a lot of famous rock stars participate, and we're teaching. We're there teaching when, and, and uh, when is that, giving, giving you lectures. Dave? What's that, when, is, when is that? Well, actually, it was scheduled for November 11th through the 14th, but they postponed it till February right. because of uh, because of COVID-19. They postponed right. it a couple of more months. Okay, and that's, that's going to be held down in Hollywood, Florida, down here. That sounds awesome, you know. Well, listen, anyway, one other thing, and this is relating to Emerald Sabbath. Um, I've started work on Volume 2, the second and final part of the project, which I'm taking slow and slow and easy. Um, I am already thinking about doing Danger Zone. Uh, some drums have already been set down by Bobby Rondinelli and all that. So would you be interested in doing bass on it sometime? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, I would love to do bass on, on Danger Zone for you, Mike. Yeah, sure. and I am in talks with Live Nation and Ticketmaster over here. They've actually contacted me today about doing a one-off concert in the LG Arena in Birmingham, where Black Sabbath had their final gig on sept uh, on the fourth of February, twenty seventeen. So, you know, I, th I you know, I hope that you may you might be consider flying over to take part. I think twelve ex members of Black Sabbath have already agreed to the concert. So, would that be something you might be up for? Sure, sure. I'd be interested in that if we, if we you can arrange it and uh, it fits everybody's schedule. You know, you and I spoke about this before, and yeah. you know, I would love to come to England. I haven't been to England for a long time, and you know, it would be great. A, bit, uh, a, bit of a, be able... a little bit of a logistical nightmare getting everyone together, but it's not impossible, yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. And uh, Casey on that, so we keep you posted anyway, like, you know? But yeah, we, yeah look, we the fans will be really looking forward to hearing your new uh, the new supergroup uh, with the guy from Overkill and all that, and um, yeah, get your, get, we're hoping get you see on Facebook and all that. But uh, thank you very much for doing the interview, Dave. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's um, always great connect and connecting with the fans. That's what rock and roll is all about. Certainly, certainly, and uh, we shall talk to you again sometime anyway. Okay, mate. Okay. All Great right. talking with you, Mike. All Visual. Right. Cheers now, bud. Take care.